No, meeting is now. Okay. I think just wait another 10 seconds. So the meeting is now streaming live. Okay. Okay, are we ready to go? Welcome everyone to the audit committee meeting of November the 8th. This is our final audit committee for the year of the school year of 2022. So welcome everyone. Thank you for attending. Um, I'd like to, um, in order to ensure that all members are, uh, are, are there, is there anyone absent? I don't believe there's anyone absent today. Everybody is, uh, is here. No, we have full attendance. Full attendance available uh, is here tonight. Thank you. Um, so now, uh, may I ask you to look at your opening prayer, and we'll begin by the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Bless us as we gather today for this meeting. Mm -hmm. Guide our minds and hearts so that we will work for the good of our community and help all your people. Teach us to be generous in our outlook, courageous in the face of difficulty, and wise in our decisions. Father, we praise you forever and ever. Amen. Uh, we would like to acknowledge that this virtual meeting is taking place on the sacred territory of the Mississauga of the Credit, and we thank them for being stewards of this land. Uh, now I'd like to ask for approval of the agenda. May I ask uh, Thomas Thomas to approve the agenda? Yes. yes. Uh, all in favor? I see. Yes, everyone's okay. <laughs> Not anyone opposed? I see. Carried. Thank you. Are there any de declaration of interest, Julie? Uh, so thank you through the chair. Um, annually, we receive a signed letter of declaration from all committee members. This is normally done at the first meeting of the fiscal year, which would have been the September meeting, which we did receive. Um, although Chair Anna De Silva was absent at that meeting, so we are now presenting her signed letter of declaration. We have that in hand. So just to report that we have it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and now I'd like to get approval for the minutes of the audit committee of the September 13th meeting, 2022 meeting, moved by Trustee Frank DiCasola. Anyone opposed? Carried. Thank you. Um, uh, business of Rising, uh, there are no pastor's remarks. We have no awards or um, presentations. There are no delegations. Uh, information updates and reports. There are no regular reports. Are there any good news items that anyone would like to share with us today? Seeing none, I will move on to the next item. We have so, no- So Chair Anna, do you mind if I add a comment there? Yeah, sure. I, I would just like to take a moment uh, to share uh, good news, but sad news as well. Um, this is the last audit committee meeting for two of our members, Trustee Anna De Silva and Trustee Frank Tecosola. Um, and we just want to congratulate them on their retirement from Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. There's a number of years of service combined between Anna and Frank. Anna is committed to trustee for 12 years and Frank for 19 years as a trustee of Dufferin Peel. And specifically on audit committee, Anna has been a member since 2019. And Trustee Frank DeCosola has had different um, appointments to audit committee starting back in 2014, again from 2017 to 2019, and then most recently for the 2022 year. We want like to thank both of them for their leadership and dedication to audit committee and the commitment to serving on this committee several times. It's been a pleasure to work with both of you and alongside with you, and we wish you all the best following your time here with Dufferin Peel. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. All, thank you everyone for your, uh, for, you know, thank you. I want to thank everyone for being, um, uh, coming and participating and being part of the audit committee. It's a very important committee for the board. And, you know, we have community members that uh, play a very strong role in helping us to make sure that the board meets its uh, issues of accountability and transparency. So I want to thank you all uh, for participating. And um, also, I'd like to thank our auditors who've been uh, amazing. Um, and uh, 
in particular, our um, our key auditor, Mr. Sun, uh, Kevin Sun, who's, you know, has brought a lot to the organization, uh, you know, has created a nice consistent process to follow and, you know, has conducted uh, um, himself and uh, the audit work uh, in an excellent way. So I want to thank everyone. And then I'd like to say a special thanks to Frank DiCasola and Thomas Thomas, who have been participating in this process as well. So I want to thank you all. Thank you very much for your service. Frank, you have something you'd like to say as well? Well, you're muted. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to add some commentary as well. Thank you. It's It's been obviously a pleasure being on this committee and seeing a lot of the good work that takes place behind the scenes. Certainly this um, committee instills what's most important to our, our system, which is transparency and accountability. And certainly I have great faith in this community and also in all the work that the Julie and your team have contributed to this committee and also um, to also the, the members who are um, appointed from our uh, outside uh, community, which really instill the importance of uh, ensuring that uh, there is great uh, accountability within our system. So it's been uh, obviously a pleasure being part of this committee and uh, we've come a long way. We've done a lot of good work and certainly we've, we've paved a very successful path for uh, a lot of good work that takes place in our, in our school board and for our, um, our parents and our students as well. So I want to thank you and, and uh, appreciate all, the, uh, all your work that you have done on this committee as well. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, well, uh, do we need to move receipt? I think we need uh, receipt of the good news okay. items, yes. Could I ask, uh, Laura, would you like to move receipt? Okay, uh, anyone oppose? It's carried, thank you. So we'll now move on to we no information or updates of reports from committee, no information update reports from administration for receipt. Uh, now we're at H, trustee committee administration reports requiring actions, H1, consolidated financial statement for the year end August 31st, 2020. Can I um, have receipt for this report? Presented by staff. Okay, moved by Rory. Anyone opposed? Okay, carried. Good afternoon. Through you, Madam Chair, I'm pleased to summarize the results of our consolidated financial statements for the fiscal year 2021-22, and that is ending August 1st, 2022. Briefly, before I uh, begin every year, as I do, I'd like to recognize uh, the hard work that staff have put into getting us to this point uh, in, our, in our process. And with us today, we have Ezra Cyrus, Manager of Accounting Services, um, and I'd also like to thank uh, the rest of his team and some of the other people in behind the scenes that put in significant amounts of time and effort to get these statements together and to, to prepare our 200 plus page EFIS package uh, in a very tight and consolidated timeline there. So obviously another challenging year with managing the impacts of COVID on our workplace. So thanks to Ezra and team uh, for getting everything in shape today. I also like to note that we have worked close with our external auditors, BDO Canada, who we finally got to meet in person for the first time this fall after working through two previous year ends. So. Today, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Marcus Sconsi and Mohamed Solman from BDO Canada, who will present a little bit later on, on the year-end uh, audits results. So it's certainly another interesting year uh, that we've, we've gone through, but uh, we make our presentations today uh, to the hard work of both teams. So thank you to both uh, BDO and our internal financial services team. I'll start by reviewing the cover report, uh, which is on H1, which begins on page eight, and then I'll highlight a few of the areas of, of the financial statements themselves. At the end, we'll kind of pause. Uh, I'll take questions on the financial statements themselves before handing things over to, uh, to Marcus and team to walk through their year-end audit report. So uh, each year we present our financial statements in accordance with our public sector accounting standards and the Ministry of, of Education's requirements for tangible capital asset reporting. The statements are reviewed by our external auditor, as I noted, BDO Canada. The statements have very few changes to the formats uh, of the statements themselves, but I will highlight some figures and certain financial statement notes during my walkthrough of the consolidated financial statements. As I mentioned, it was certainly another unusual year due to the impact of COVID-19, uh, very similar to last year in some respects. I'd like to highlight, uh, as we did in the report, that our financials reflect an operating deficit of $28.4 million. 
However, to see the true results on our operations, uh, we have to remove certain items to get back to what the ministry deems as a, a budget compliance deficit. So we remove revenues used to purchase land because we have to set that aside to, for accounting purposes. We set aside our, our school generated funds because they're not available for general use in our operations and some other accounting items such as our interest accrual amounts on long-term debt. So that leaves us with a total compliance operating deficit for ministry purposes of $36 million. It's critical to note that the deficit was not structural in nature, but was caused by one significant ongoing budget pressure, which we've been spending a bit of time on mm -hmm. lately, and that is our long-term disability plan, or what we refer to as LTD. COVID operations have provided for some savings from supply teaching costs and some other supplies and services, but this still has been overshadowed by our LTD costs in total. The obligations of LTD plan provided for in-year costs of $44.3 million, and there was an accrual at year end of $9.8 million, representing amounts still owing to our provider above the premium submitted during the year. Also of note, uh, included in our revenues was uh, $17.2 million of stabilization COVID-19 funding provided by the ministry. And that has assisted greatly with the impacts of the ongoing pandemic. And uh, just shortly, I'll note where the LTD expense shows up in our financial statements when I cover one of our notes. So with that, I'll now walk through the financial statements uh, and some of the notes to the financial statements themselves. And as I noted, I'll, I'll go through it and then I'll uh, pause and take questions on the statements themselves before I hand things over to Marcus and team. So I'm just gonna put this up on my screen. Uh, so it'll make it easier for people to kind of follow along. So if someone could confirm that you can see. Yes, we can see yes, it. Yes, we can, Brian. Excellent, love it when technology works. <laughs> All right, so the statements begin on page 10, but I'm going to move down to page 12 to start. So page 12 represents what we call the management report. This outlines that the statements are management's responsibilities, so the responsibility of the board, and we're, we're responsible for all of the controls over our assets and the reliability of the information presented. And then the next two pages, uh, BDO can speak to a little more shortly, but this represents the auditor's report. Uh, and I just will note uh, at a high level that the board has received an unqualified audit opinion again this year. I'll try to make this a little bigger because there's lots of numbers on here. There we go. So first on our, our statement of, of consolidated statement of financial position, we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, first note, of uh, highlight here is that the cash and cash equivalents have dropped significantly from the prior year. And in fact, there's also an amount called temporary borrowing. So as of August 31st, we were borrowing from our financial institution, $56.4 million. So that kind of offsets the cash position that we had on hand last year. There was an amount or there is an amount showing as $8.7 million of cash. That represents the amount from our school generated funds bank accounts. So we show that separately again from what we were doing from our operating position. The Council of Seawable Province of Ontario has increased significantly. This relates to our financial grant calculations, what we call our grants for student needs, relative to the cash received from our government and the municipalities during the year. So last year was an accounts payable. This year it amounts to an accounts receivable for amounts that the ministry owes us and they will pay us after we submit our EFIS package to the ministry. There's also a lot more funds owing to us just from various priorities and partnership funds. These are what we call our PPFs, special grants outside of our grants for student needs. So there's quite a bit of accounts receivable on our books for that at year end as well. And just tying to what I just mentioned there, the accounts receivable has also gone down. And that does tie to, as I just noted, we have a receivable for our amount owing from the province for our grants. And there was also a significant amount owing on our LTD uh, payable last year. Uh, that's gone down quite a bit this year. As I mentioned, it's only 9.8 million compared to a significant amount last year. And finally, on the statement, I'll just uh, highlight uh, the deferred revenues have had quite a change there as well on that line. During the year, the board disposed of a vacant property with proceeds of $20 million uh, being deferred for future use. And I'll highlight that a little more details on that a little bit later in the notes. And also we had an increase to our education development charges, uh, which we use to future, uh, purchase land in the future. So that money's been set aside. And finally, there's uh, also a balance on hand of our inventories related to all the PPE, the personal protective equipment we've been receiving and holding in our inventory 
from uh, the Ministry of Public and Business Services. Uh, that used to be MGCS formerly, now they renamed the ministry. So that inventory supply, as you can see, shows up as much larger than last year as well. So we've set aside the funding and set aside the inventory of those to be used in a future year. We'll go down to the next statement, our statement of operations. Our GSN grants are down slightly from, from last year, and that makes sense uh, when we have a decline in our student enrollment year over year. We've seen that trend continuing over the past couple of years. Um, and year over year, when we also look at um, our GSN and our education property tax together, we are down a bit from budget as well. Same concept due to our enrollment decline. Other provincial grants um, represents what I call those PPF, those special grants for targeted initiatives. Uh, that also includes that $17.2 million in stabilization funding for COVID-19. So that's why that's quite a bit higher than uh, prior year, as well as uh, compared to budget. Uh, and you can see the school generated funds activities have increased significantly over prior year. That makes sense because this past year was a return to more normal processes and in-class learning. And with that came uh, quite a few more extracurricular activities than we saw in the previous year. On the expense side, we've seen, again, decreases with an overall decline in enrollment. It makes sense that our, our services also go down with that, less staff involved with actually uh, teacher instruction. Again, the, the LTD costs have declined from last year but there's still a significant impact on our in-year financials. Uh, these are part of the benefits uh, costs, which I'll show you on another line in the financial statement notes in a moment. So again, the annual deficit shown in our financial statements just down here is $28.3 million. The next two statements I won't spend any time on, but those are really additional accompanying financial information, uh, looking at our cash and the changes in our net debts on the statements I've just reviewed. So I'm going to skip down now to let's go into page 25. So I mentioned that uh, we, we had sold a piece of vacant property here. So here's the disclosure noting that we sold the property for $20 million. Uh, it had a carrying value on our financial statements of $2 million, just over $2 million. So there's a gain of just under $18 million reflected in our financial statements. And that amount has been added to our proceeds of disposition, which is a, de a deferred revenue, hence why that balance has increased this year. I'll skip down now to note seven. Uh, note seven, just uh, one highlight here. One of our debentures uh, was matured this year, so that's why it's now showing a zero balance compared to last year. So one down, about nine to go, but uh, that's all fully funded by the ministry. Just a, a highlight a highlight there that one is finally matured. On the same page here, just down a little bit, I wanna spend a little time just talking about, uh, as I mentioned, the, the uh, borrowing that we have in place. So during the year, we work to try and improve our cash flow management. So we set up a capital borrowing resolution and then a corresponding capital borrowing facility with our bank. So this is helping us assist with our day-to-day -day operating cash flow needs. So this really provides the detail about the amounts that are available under the resolutions, the amounts available with the banks, and then any draw on those amounts as of year end. Uh, I will note, in case anyone did, uh, did see it, we had a little cutoff here where on the last sentence, there's a little bit of the words missing there. So that should reflect the sentence to say, the outstanding amount at any given time would substantially represent the unreceived or uncollected balance of the estimated revenues and the outstanding capital expenditure grant payments. So we'll make sure that gets changed before we forward this to the Board of Trustees for approval of the board meeting upcoming. Note 10 here, I'd just like to, to highlight this is additional disclosure this year. This is a, a, new, a new piece that the ministry recommended from an Auditor General review. So this is meant to provide more detail to financial statement users on how the board obtains its primary funding. So I mentioned our grants for student needs. That sets the total amount of funding that the board is entitled to. And then we receive cash payments from the ministry and through our municipal tax payments. And the ministry is on hand or is accountable for the, the remaining balance that we haven't yet received from the monthly provincial payments or our quarterly tax payments from the municipality. So this gives a few more details about where the actual funding comes from. And note 11, I always like to highlight this one because it shows our total expenses, but kind of in a different way from our traditional financial statements I've already looked at. It shows it by the, the type of expense here. So as I mentioned, long-term disability is a significant expense on our financial statements. So on the second line here, where it refers to employee benefits, 
that's where long-term disability is included. So it's clear, clearly down from last year. It's good news. We're down from last year, but it's still above budget. As I mentioned, we have about a $9 million extra additional hit to our financials this year as LTD ended a little higher than what we hoped it would be at original um, revised estimates back in last December. And just down a little more, one highlight. Notes 19 and 20, similar to past years, uh, these reflect the impact of our operations uh, from COVID-19. So again, still ongoing impacts with PPE flowing through our financial statements and additional costs, and obviously LTD as a, an impact of COVID-19 as well. Um, In-kind transfers there from the Ministry of Public and Business Service Delivery, because of the significant nature of the amount of the uh, PPE, the equipment that we receive from the, uh, the ministry, we have to flow that through our financial statements as an in-kind transfer. So it shows up as a matching revenue and an expense. And then there's remaining portions showing up on our, on our statement of financial position as inventories. So I'll pause there. That's the end of the, the highlights that I want to make at that point and see if there's any specific questions to the financial statements themselves. And then um, once we're done with the questions, then I'll hand it over to Marcus and team to go through their year-end report. I'm going to set up a speaker's list. So Frank, De Casola, anybody else? Laura. Laura, okay. Yeah. Frank, Laura, anyone else? Okay, Frank, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Do we have any uh, adjusting entries? Through you, Madam Chair, there are no year-end adjusting entries um, noted by, by us or through the auditors, but uh, they can speak more to their reports where they highlight some of the results of their audit work uh, shortly. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, Laura. Yes, uh, thank you. Through the chair, um, Brian. I'm just. I have a question uh, regarding the stabilization funding. Mm -hmm. uh, so it says on page nine that the board received seventeen point two million dollars in in stabilization COVID nineteen funding. And my question is. Um, the use of these funds, is it restricted for specific uses or like where would we, where is it included in the financial statements? Very sure, excellent question. So the ministry identified certain criteria and certain uh, boards that qualified for that as needing additional financial assistance through incremental costs. So as I've noted, ours really where the focus was on long-term disability. So that's pretty much where the whole amount has been applied to. We obviously have other costs here or there, whether it's um, increased use of our ventilation systems or whatnot. And there were some little grants here and there to support uh, some of those incremental expenses. But this one here, uh, it's still a drop in the bucket towards our $44 million LTV, but um, we're, we're happy that they did give us that funding and it's been applied uh, to the full balance of LTV. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, also through the chair, with respect to um, student enrollment being down, uh, would we expect to see a decrease in the transportation costs? So through the chair, uh, in theory, it depends on where I guess they would be coming from and whether they qualify for transportation or not. So. Uh, costs will fluctuate up or down. Uh, unfortunately, the, the funding model, which is currently being reviewed by the government, because it, it is very outdated and doesn't reflect the, the current cost pressures that boards have been seeing with our escalating, our escalating costs, it, it doesn't really tie together on the, how many are using the system versus how they fund the system. It's more based on a kind of a, uh, an annual basis on what our funding was way, way back, and they just kind of give a little top up if you qualify for it every year. So. Uh, that is something we constantly remind the ministry when we do any kind of um, grants for student needs uh, input, and we remind them that uh, we've, we've had a deficit, as noted in our financial statements on the transportation line, and we welcome the review of that model to see if we can get increased funding to support our true transportation costs. Thank you. I would imagine with the fuel costs, there's going to be some pressure to, from the uh, transportation companies to... Uh, Try to get some more funding. So um, I and uh, and I'm happy to see that it's stable from 20 between the 2021 fiscal year and the 2022. Mm -hmm. I'm just a little curious. I, I'm interested in knowing how it looks so far, but I would imagine just knowing like from the growth that I've seen in the area where I am, the huge impact on all the new homes. Everybody has busing here, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. It's going to be a bit of a challenge. That's why I'm asking because the enrollment was down. I, I mean, I would imagine it's not down by much because the difference in the GSN is 3 million, not even. So mm-hmm. it doesn't look like the decrease in enrollment really translates to a huge change in uh, costs and grants, which is good. I mean, you know, the board still wants the money. Um, and, you know, you mentioned long-term disability. <laughs> Every time I hear that, I cringe, but um, that's not specifically identified in the actual financial statement body itself, right? It's in a note, is that correct? So through the chair, uh, it's, it doesn't have its own line at all because it's, it's part of what I mentioned there as the employee benefits line. Okay. Uh, so it is kind of buried within there, but um, overall in the COVID impact, uh, it, we do kind of highlight the impact of COVID is having on absenteeism of staff in general and students as well being, you know, unfortunately not being present as much throughout the year. Uh, so it's kind of, it kind of comes around it a little bit um, differently there, but that's why I speak to it um, intentionally because of the severe impact. And in our report itself, where it does highlight the severe impact it's having, you know, we are in uh, constant uh, discussions with the ministry on the impact it's having on our board um, in, a, in a very negative way moving forward. And through the chair, um, are you are you in t- are you in contact with other boards? Are they experiencing similar material hits to their results on the LTD as well? So through the chair, that's that's a complicated question. Yeah. I'll, I'll get my <laughs> that one. Um, That's the lawyer answer. It depends. So uh, our board is unique uh, in that we have a fully paid for and fully board funded long-term disability plan. So we pay for all costs uh, that happen within the year. Other boards have varying scenarios of that. So most of the time it's, uh, it's, it's employee paid or some portion of employee paid. So for example, it could be an 80, 20 split between employee or employer paid. So it can vary between the boards that have some piece of an LTE plan. It can uh, also vary between um, which groups that they, uh, a board may pay for, because they can be selective upon which groups they want to pay for that versus having it fully employee paid. Uh, and, and the third factor there is that uh, it depends on the financial model. So ours is what we call a refund accounting. So we're accountable for every single dollar of cost uh, at year end. Other boards uh, may have a, an LTD as more of an insurance product where they they work with an insurer and it can be uh, a flat amount that they agree to with their insurer. And then depending on the results and the risk, the insurer then absorbs whatever that may be and uh, the board will just pay a flat fee and there's no other impact at year end depending on what the usage was, whether it was up or down. So varying different impacts. Uh, don't know the other boards because the plans are typically held if they're employee with some kind of other, um, perhaps with the benefit trusts or with an outside organization. So it's really then, uh, to make sure that organization, that trust kind of manages the plan and then employees pay into that. So it's hard to see because some of them may not hit the board financials at all if it's truly an insured product that's not part of the board's financial statements. So it's a long-winded way of saying it, it truly does vary. Um, but we're, we are hearing costs and are seeing some that do go up, but not to the same extent as us, because unfortunately we're fully 100% paid for uh, as part of our board financials. Thank you. Are there any other uh, any other questions from anyone? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to ask some questions. If I could just pass the chair on to is it Trustee DiCasola or Thomas? Who's the vice chair? I can't remember. <laughs> Trustee Thomas. And okay, Trustee and Thomas, Thomas. Thank you. Okay. 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 Um, Go ahead, Anna. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to ask. Uh, first of all. Um, Thank you for the report um, and thank you for displaying it on the screen. That was, that's was that been very helpful like, so that everyone can see it. Um, uh, but my, in terms of the long-term disability, I would just like to understand the, what is the LTD comprised of? Is it benefits that are being provided? Are, is it subscriptions per person? Can you tell me what is that amount? What comprises that amount? A few different components uh, through, through the chair, uh, a few different components within a long-term disability. The, the primary expense is paying for a staff person that cannot, uh, cannot work. So they are, um, they've 
they've been uh, moved from a short-term disability by you know using their or exhausting their sick days and then have to move over to the long-term disability plan after a, a 75 day waiting period so once the third party uh, in this case uh, providers assesses their uh, their needs and their medical conditions then they will be approved for long-term disability and they can be uh, they can be on this long-term disability with 70% uh, of their salary covered up until the point they uh, retire or resign from the board or until they hit 65 years old. So it depends on the nature of uh, whether it's an injury or a disability or a medical illness. Um, and hopefully they, they can come back to work and then our health promotion wellness team will, will work with them closely to make sure they can get back into the, the hopefully whatever their, their um, previous employment position was. Uh, but in some cases, we have uh, long duration employees that unfortunately uh, do not return to work until they hit one of those conditions that I noted. So the majority mm -hmm. of the costs are tied to um, compensating those staff people for uh, recovering 70% of their salary. And then there's also administrative components to go with that um, to compensate our provider for all their work to assess, provide, go through the applications uh, and provide the payments to those individuals. Okay, so it's comprised of the actual, so what about the, um, so, and then what about the benefits? So is it, do we pay a fee for each individual as well in the board, uh, each employee for the benefit, the actual benefit of that? Or is it just for administration and for those individuals who have, uh, who go on the long-term disability plan? Uh, share a good question. So there's two components to that. So when uh, we start the year, we work with our provider and we come up with what we call the premium. So the premium is the, the monthly cash flow that we provide to our provider as our best estimate of what we think the costs, the total cost for LTD will be for the year. Mm -hmm. And then when we get to, and, and the costs are just, as we've just spoken about the actual people that are on the disability, as well as administrative costs on top of that. Mm -hmm. So we hope the premium will be what the costs are when we get to get to the end of the year. Once they've assessed all the people, all that are on LTD, the ones who've gone back to work, any new claims that are kind of uh, in the in the hopper, they're being assessed, and they kind of do a, a full assessment to say, okay, the total cost of LTD will be, in this case, let's say forty million dollars. And if we only paid thirty and change, then we have an accrual at year end to provide to that. Uh, provider for for the amount that we have to fund for that cost. So the premium is kind of that cash flow that we're hoping is really to fund the total costs of the plan once we get to our year end position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. And it is based on uh, just a just to close the loop on that. It is based on the premium is based on the number of staff that we do have on the salary. So every month we look at what we've uh, what we've paid out in our in our salary costs, and that's then a percentage that we have to pay to our our provider. That's how we could have estimate the cash flow or the premium on a monthly basis. So essentially what you're doing is estimating the amount of usage of LTD, then dividing that by the number of employees, and then that would be your premium for the the years. That is that right? Is that how yeah. it would work? Pretty much. Sure. Yeah, that's roughly correct. Based on every okay. month kind of payroll that comes up with the salary amount. And then we multiply by this, uh, this percentage of salary that uh, we think will cover the cost. And that's the monthly premium we actually remit to the, to the provider and that year ends. In this case, we true it up and say, okay, this year we owe them just over $9 million to, mm -hmm. to get close uh, to, to fulfill that gap in the cost versus the premium we paid to mm -hmm. them. Okay. And so it, over the pandemic, we've had an increase, obviously, in these the uh, the cost of this uh, this benefit because we've had more. My understanding is we've had more people who have gone on to long term disability. Um, mm -hmm. Is that correct uh, understanding? Yes, through the chair. Uh, traditionally, we had just over two hundred um, plus or minus kind of on an annual basis, and then uh, that was pre pandemic, and then throughout the pandemic, now we're just under four hundred people currently in the plan. So we've doubled the number of people that have gone on to LTD. That's correct, which financially kind of makes sense from the figures that we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in terms of the future, if things start to settle down, do we anticipate that this will go down as well? Um, what are, what's the thinking around that? Uh, through the chair, that's the crystal ball I wish I had, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I really do hope things will settle down as as we kind of learn to live with COVID as another type of illness, uh, and, and hopefully it's no different than some of the other traditional illnesses where, you know, you need to take your time off and then you come back to work. 
Um, but the, the other side of that, there was um, in Peel, because we had such a significant uptake in, in COVID in the beginning, I think there was a, uh, a, a very, a very significant hit to people in, in terms of their, their mental health and well-being and how to, how to live with that, whether it's a family at home or coming to work and working, knowing that there's, you know, there could be illnesses that you, you can't really tell are in the classroom that didn't exist before. So mm -hmm. the, the mental health impact, uh, as we're hearing, has been you know, out there for students, uh, also exists for staff. And that's the challenging part is trying to see if you know, some of those people can, can get over that um, mental health um, illness and then possibly return to work. We have seen quite a spike in the mental health uh, as a percentage of the other traditional diagnosis of, uh, that may be out there and supported by long-term disability. Mm -hmm. So people could be off for, for cancers or, or other illnesses or musculoskeletal diseases. And then after a certain amount of time, they come back to work if they, if they get better. Our mm -hmm. provider is, is showing and we're seeing the evidence that mental health illnesses can linger longer than some of those even traditional illnesses. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like a, a short term, you know, come off and come back to work. Uh, it can be multi-year. So mm -hmm. I, I hope that uh, the answer is yes, that slowly those people will come back to work if they're able and this number will come back down. Mm -hmm. uh, will it come back down to the, the former 200 numbers? I, I can't say. So I think it's going with us for some time, but uh, I can only hope that it's, it's come down from last year. That's a very good sign, but I hope that we'll still come down again when we look forward to the, the following years. Okay, and the other question I have is, have you seen a spike since the, the memorandum of understanding that occurred in the first the bargaining when we went to a change in terms of how we were paying teachers um, in terms of their sick benefits? Um, at one point we had uh, teachers were, uh, prior to that year, teachers were uh, able to accumulate sick benef benefits uh, year to year. Mm -hmm. And since the memorandum of understanding and the contract that was signed with the new healthcare benefits, now they have an allocated uh, number of benefits that they can use a year. Have we seen a change in uh, in the LTD based on uh, on that change as well? So through the chair, I, I think um, it's hard to equate that to, to LTD because uh, whether before they had the bank or now they have the 11 sick days that you're referring to, and then they have 120 short-term disability days on top of that, uh, LTD doesn't kick in until the 75-day waiting period has been exhausted. So uh, an employee will have to go through 75 days, use up the 11 sick days, and then the, a chunk of their, their short-term disability days. Uh, and then at that point, they must apply for long-term disability and go through that process and go through those medical assessments. So um, the days that were there before, you know, they, they would still kind of, they're just slightly different, but they would still have to have exhausted 75 days um, and, and have a significant enough illness that uh, they hit the 75 days and then must be assessed in, under the long-term disability plan. So uh, there's probably an impact for sure, but it shouldn't impact LTD unless someone hits those 75 days, uh, no different than they did before. Okay, so there's nothing in the current sick benefits that are being paid by the but obviously from the board, but through the Ministry of, uh, of, through our contract and through the Ministry of Education, that has made an impact on uh, the usage of LTD. Is that what I'm hearing you say then? So, uh, through the chair, I think that's fair because we've always had to pay for sick days. Uh, let's say when a teacher's off for a day, then we have to bring in a, a supply teacher to cover that classroom for the day. So that's always existed and we have a, a separate budget for that and we bring in okay. staff to cover those those costs. The, um, the financial hit comes to us when, uh, let's say, someone's been approved for LTD after the 75 days, they've gone through the medical assessments, they've been approved for LTD, then we have to bring in a typically a long-term occasional teacher because it's a much longer right. at that point to the, the end of or the, the foreseen end of their illness, if that can be forecasted. So, so essentially, we're paying for two employees, you know, 70% of one and then the full composite for the other while the person is away on the on the long-term disability portion right yeah, now you were okay so you were saying that other boards do not ha have different plans um and they have other uh, uh options um and that we're unique uh and so this it, can you explain to me what exactly is unique about our situation are they are other boards obtaining the money from the ministry for the portion that the employer is paying? Are they finding that money internally? How are we unique through mm -hmm. the chair? So through the chair, um, we're unique that we pay for 100% of LTD costs for all uh, staff groups, uh, and there's no employee share on that. 
And the second part that I noted is that we, uh, in, the, in the type of the plan that we have, the financial plan with our long-term disability carrier is such that we, we absorb 100% of the risk. So we, we pay for all the costs uh, through the premium and then and any extra year end of the cost to exceed the premiums or vice versa. There were years where we actually had savings because the premiums uh, paid uh, came in more than the costs we had. So it kind of gives you, a, we'll have some, some years that are up, some years are down, depending on the nature and the illnesses that, are, that have been approved for LTV. Other boards, as you noted, have, have varying different models of long-term disability. So there's, uh, I think there's just under 30 boards that I'm aware of that have some form of long-term disability costs on their financial statements. Uh, and as you noted there, the, the, the ministry, I should note first, the ministry um, has been phasing out uh, the retirement gratuity funding uh, over a 12 year period. And that's what um, back in 79, our board traded uh, long term disability, or I should say negotiated long term disability for retirement gratuities. So we phased out retirement gratuities, but then um, we picked up long term disability. So then the ministry, um, they got rid of uh, retirement gratuities in the 2012, I believe it was 2012 or 2014 and to all boards so that then uh, they started phasing out those costs. So they said, we can get rid of this 2% of our benefit benchmark funding. Um, and some boards arguably could have been using that benefit benchmark funding to support long-term disability costs because uh, it is a benefit benchmark. And I, I noted long-term disability is on a benefit expense line. So we're kind of being hit on two sides where our costs are going up. Uh, we have no way to contain those right now. And uh, then on the other funding side, we've lost that little bit of funding that we potentially could have used or have used in the past to apply against the long-term disability costs. So uh, other boards- but, but Aren't noted, other boards also losing that funding as well though? Yes, so through the chair, that's absolutely correct. They're also losing that same funding benchmark that we are. So they've had to then either do the, uh, the same as we have in the past where we've had declining enrollments or have to make budget cuts. We have to reduce expenses somewhere to try and balance our overall budget when we don't have the funding available anymore. So arguably they've had to find that balance somewhere internally. Um, and unfortunately we just can't find $44 million to, to balance those books on an annual basis. That's just impossible. So does that mean that other boards have less numbers of employees than us, uh, significantly less, that they are able to manage it and we're not through the chair? All right. So, Julia, so I don't want to jump in because Brian's doing an excellent job of answering your, all of your LTD questions, but I really just want to emphasize that one of the biggest differences for Duff and Peel is that we have this employer fully funded plan for every single occupational worker group. That's every union association, non-union member of the board. What you're going to see in other boards, whether they have some component of LTD is that it's only for maybe one employee group or maybe two, not every single group like Deaf and Peel. That is very unique across the province that we have it in place fully funded for every single employee group that we have. That's gonna be your main difference that you see between Deaf and Peel and all the other boards. And when you say, how are they able to fund it? It's because they have perhaps committed to LTD for maybe one group. And they've been able to somehow deficit manage it somehow, which we were doing for a number of years, trying to manage our balanced budget position, including the LTD that was fairly stable for a several number of years until we saw these increases start pre-COVID and three, through COVID to where we are today. So I think, I think it just needs to be really clear that it's because of every single employee group that we fully fund. So that we're the only group that has every single group fully funded. That is where the difference is between and the uh, and and then when other what other boards have are are just certain groups and they're able to find the funding for it. Yeah. And we're not. That, and that's the, the main difference through the chair, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're not getting any additional funds no. for their uh, to pay for their LTD as well. Correct. No, mm -hmm. they're not. Okay. Okay. Um. So through the chair, Mr. Chair, I am I am thinking that we need to have a you know uh, it was request it was said that you know it's the LTD is not noted anywhere in the in the in the report and I think we should have something noted. I think it's important that we just don't 
uh, say here we have 42, you know, whatever, $40 million deficit, it's for employee benefits. I think there should be a, a highlight that explains what the situation is somehow and identifies the uniqueness of such the situation in this report, because uh, only to make sure that people understand the situation that we're in and why it's unique to us. Um, I would suggest that we do need to highlight that. I would like to see that in the report. Uh, if it's already in the report, uh, Anna, there is a $43.7 million uh, deficit related to LTD. It's already in the report. Uh, I, I realize Bye. it's Bye, in Brian. the report, but I, I, I understood earlier uh, when they, I think uh, uh, Laura uh, mentioned and asked, or someone mentioned and asked that, we, why do we not have that highlighted? And, and uh, Superintendent Hester mentioned that we, we just have it under employee um, employee uh, benefits. Uh, so I was saying that we need to make sure we highlight the reason why, which I don't think has a specific uh, uh, highlight highlighted area. So through the chair, and I know Superintendent Hester will show you where in the statements, but we really do follow a, a general format for financial statements. It, mm -hmm. You don't go start creating different lines in that. It, it's general format for year over year consistency as well. There is reference in the note. Um, so Brian can show you how we've shown that in the notes. So to keep the consistent chair, approach. Impact of COVID-19. So through the chair, yeah. So the difference, as you're noting, um, Trustee De Silva, is that in, a, in the report attached to financials, we explicitly have provided those details. In the financial statements themselves, as uh, Executive Superintendent Chairback has noted, we don't, we don't typically stray from what the ministry says. These are comparable financial statements to each of the boards. So the any, any user of financial statements can see any school board and have a fairly similar um, comparability between them. Um, we do note explicitly here, uh, the board has experienced physical closure of schools based on public health recommendations, experienced increased staff and student absenteeism, and then we'll continue on from there. So we haven't explicitly said LTD in there, but that's, um, that's something that we could take direction on, uh, as you see. You know, so, you know, through the chair. So here's what my thinking is. Y you, you know what? You're right. You know, the, the board wants to compare apples. The uh, ministry wants to compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges. But the fact is that we're unique. So, you know, it's not necessarily an impact of COVID-19. It's, you know, an impact of, you know, how we're, you know, how we're funded differently or rather how, you know, how our plan is unique to others. So that's why I thought that that it should be highlighted somehow. That would be why I would say that we would have a special note on that. Um, I don't think it really highlights the reason why we have this uh, deficit uh, in terms of, and that how it's solely, you know, related to the long-term disability and how that is unique to our board versus other boards. That's where I'm coming from. And I think that, you know, given some of the situation that we're in right now, you know, I, th you know, I think it's important to highlight that. Um, that's why I brought it up through the chair. We, you know, through the chair, we can take that back and perhaps expand on the note. So it's, it's a little clearer. I, I think that there. would be helpful. I think that um, is good. Can I actually, I just have one question, comment okay, um, through the chair. Yeah. Uh, with respect to this note number 20, I would wonder, I'm wondering if the impact of this, you know, say for example, we're speaking specifically about long-term disability and because this note kind of gives the impression that, you know, COVID-19 when you know, the numbers, people aren't getting sick as much, that it'll change. And I mean, long-term disability means long-term. So I guess the question would be, is it really an impact of COVID-19? Yeah, sure. It may have started because of that, but now then I, I'm wondering, well, if we're, we're specifically talking about long-term disability. Um, you know, we're already starting to see some changes in in what's happened in the schools i mean everybody you know the, the students are all back in school full time um i think in our last meeting uh, was it mentioned that you don't have any online school right now there's no full-time online students is that correct or am i wrong so through the chair we are still offering fully remote classes this year 
It's oh, still okay. out there, yes. So, so my point is that, you know, we're already seeing the reverse of what happened with COVID because of the, you know, we're not closed down so many days. Well, we haven't this year, thank goodness, from COVID. Um, so, and then I guess also for me, when I think long-term disability, I, you know, I'm, I'm listening to these conversations and it's, there's another side of it too. And uh, I think um, Superintendent Hester alluded to it is that there's other people that have to be brought in um, either as a long-term occasional teacher or, you know, short-term, but there's additional cost on top of the long-term disability. So it's, and that's not, I'm assuming that the additional cost is in the line called salaries and, and where is it on page, on your page um, 20? Salary and wages. Would that be where the salaries for the uh, supply teachers are showing? So through the chart on the charts on, uh, on note 11, uh, salaries and wages, and then the corresponding benefits would be the two that would go up if we ever had to hire uh, either short term occasional teachers or any kind of long term occasional instructors. Okay, so so I so I I kind of I'm not sure I'm 100% comfortable with the note. 20 indicating that these costs are impacts of COVID-19. They started from that, I'm I'm assuming, but it almost gives the impression that, you know, when things return back to normal, we may see some reversal of the of the down, the the increased cost, which I it's long term. <laughs> it's gonna be long term before we see any benefit from from COVID uh these I don't I I'm Hesitant to say stabilized, but uh, as you said, uh, you know, when everybody learns how to live with COVID at some point, then, you know, we would hope that we can see some benefit from that, some, some reduced costs. So through the chair, uh, God, I that was your comment, Laura? Yeah. yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. So, Brian, you finish or uh, how we are going to proceed? We have, there is a second motion also there. Yeah. Uh, well, so before we get there, um, Chair, um, at this point, I'm done with my part of the financial statements and the discussion of the report, but um, we can't forget about our external auditors because uh, they have to go through their year end audit report. So, at this point, um, through the chair, I'd like to hand things over to uh, Marcus and, uh, and team to review their. Um, audit year end report, which begins on page 37 of the package. Okay, so before we go there, may I ask, do I need to have a motion to make an adjustment to the um, to the report to include uh, a, 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 one of the numbers to be regarding the long term disability? So that section that uh, how, uh, explains some of the impacts to why the budget is as it is. So um, do we need a chair, um, we could take direction okay. from the committee. We said we would take that back and try to add some Adjustment. detail to the note so that we can approve as a, it's draft format anyway right now. So okay. we can just take that as direction. Okay. So if I do, I need also I, if I could ask that the staff be directed to review that and to clearly highlight, you know, um, you know, the impact of the LTD on the budget and that it be cl more clear about, you know, the differences and that it's identified uh, perhaps not out, outside of the impact of COVID-19 through the chair. Okay. Okay. Thanks. We'll could, I, could I ask one question? Sorry, it's Rory. My okay, apologies. Rory. Okay, my, apologies my apologies for my voice. I'm battling this flu bug. Um, bottom line, the plan is uninsured and everyone's covered. Are either of those two things changeable? Through the chair, um, another good question uh, and complicated one. Um, the issue that we've had since 2014, I believe it is when all, uh, all things financial became negotiated at a central table between um, the ministry uh, the trustee associations representatives and um, the union groups themselves 
So the board cannot negotiate any kind of changes to our, our benefits. So we can't change, let's say, for example, the, the percentage of the salary that's received or uh, any co-pays or whatnot without having negotiations taken on uh, centrally. So that's, that's one piece. Um, another, another piece to note, um, we, we've been working with um, external consultants to review everything that we can tied to LTV, say, what can we do? What is within our power uh, to, to try and either mitigate costs or limit costs where we, where we do have the ability to change things? So, um, you know, we're, we're working through those steps right now, um, piece by piece, to try and uh, to see if there's anything under, under our, um, our direction that we can modify. So unfortunately, because this is a benefit, it must be centrally negotiated and we're waiting for kind of the, um, those ongoing negotiations, which you've probably heard of uh, most recently in, uh, in the news that are, uh, that are currently ongoing with um, the first large union group. I see, thanks, Brian. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, bye. So Thomas, uh, so should we move yeah. it over then or? I don't know. I think I will have to, um, until the end, I have to chair it. Okay, go ahead then. Can you continue? Uh, okay. okay. So through the chair at this point, uh, Marcus, if you're still there, I can't see if you're there, but if you can, uh, if you wish to come on and you can speak to things, I'll try and um, if you give me the page reference, I can kind of follow along so people can see on the screen there, if that's helpful to people. Okay. Thank you, Brian, and, and through you, Madam Chair, we're pleased to present the results of our audit for the year ended August 31st, 2022. Uh, I'll keep this at a high level uh, in the interest of time, and of course, as always, we welcome any questions throughout the presentation. I'm going to cover the beginning and the end parts, and I'll pass it off to Mo to cover the audit risks in the middle. So, Brian, if you could please scroll down to page four, audit at a glance. I'll just touch on the three points at the top of the page preliminary materiality as we communicated to you was 17.5 million, final materiality remained that number. Fraud, which is an item we do talk about at every meeting because we are required to discuss with you. Um, we are not aware of any fraud. Uh, we did reach out after the planning meeting and we're not made aware of any fraud by the audit committee members or by management. Uh, so there was no fraud to consider while conducting our external audit. And then finally, independence, uh, which is a requirement of our rules of professional conduct. Uh, we confirm that BDO remains independent of the board um, in terms of completing our year-end audit. So if you want to scroll to the next page, please. Status of the audit. There's four items listed here. Uh, they're typically outstanding at this point. So this is, this is nothing of concern. Uh, we need to receive our final legal letters, uh, which, which have been dated for next week, I believe, once we receive those back. Uh, that'll be the last piece of audit evidence. Of course, the approval of the financial statements by the board um, will then trigger the last two items, which is the management rep letter to be signed, and then us to complete our verbal subsequent events work review through the date of that approval by the board of trustees. I'll get down to the independent auditors, auditors report uh, later, as that's down in Appendix A. So right now, I'll pass it over to Mo to touch on the high level audit risks, and then I will complete the presentation. Thank you, Marcus. So I'll keep this brief uh, as well, but during our planning meeting back in September, we discussed some of the significant risks and other audit risk areas uh, that we will focus on during our audit. The first uh, significant risk was complex information technology environment, mainly due to the complexity of the information systems. So we had our information system specialists, certified information system specialists involved during our audit. They worked with our audit team to do a complete overall assessment of the IT environment, which included reviewing application controls, system security controls, and access controls and change controls. We also reviewed the system processes and completed our walkthroughs over the controls, automated, as well as some manual ones that were crucial to our steps. And all our audit testing in this area was executed as planned. There was a control improvement point noted, which we'll bring up after as part of our control improvement areas. Uh, the other key risk was grant revenue, mainly due to the revenue may be incorrectly deferred into future periods or recognized in the current year as an error. So we reviewed the grant confirmations with ministry as well as the continuity schedules to ensure the all grant, that all grant activity is tracked 
and all significant amounts were vouched to contracts or agreements to ensure revenue is appropriately recognized and deferred. And then finally, our other significant risk was management override of control, which management due to its authority is in a unique position to override internal controls, which could potentially result in misleading information. This is a standard risk in all our audits. And we tested the journal appropriateness of journal entries that were recorded in the journal ledger, uh, looked at the appropriateness of the bias, uh, looked at the appropriateness of significant estimates completed for any biases or represented any risk of material misstatements. And all our audit testing in this in these two areas was executed as planned and no errors were noted. Now we have some other areas of audit risk, which include payroll and capital asset acquisitions. Payroll just mainly due to the magnitude of the payroll expenditure at the board. We used a combination of test the controls and analytical procedures, including analysis of the year-end accruals to ensure that the balance recognized was appropriate. For capital asset acquisitions, we performed audit procedures which included substantive and analytical testing of both construction in progress and capital asset additions. As well as for amortization, we reviewed the amortization rates for reasonability, as well as tested for indicators of impairment, and reviewed the classification of assets potentially held for a sale. All added audit testing in this area was executed as planned, and no errors were noted. Uh, just another audit matter. I, I won't touch into it too much in detail. I think uh, Brian and the uh, and the board touched up on it quite significantly earlier. Is the long term disability benefits. As Brian mentioned, the board self funds its long term disability plan. And due to COVID, there was a deficit or a total cost of 44 million in 2022 compared to 79 million last year. And there is a shortfall accrual of seven, almost 10 million this year compared to 63 million at year end. I'll pass it off to Marcus unless there's any questions related to this section of the report. All right, sounds like none. So I'll continue on. Internal control matters. Just a reminder that we do review the key controls and in some cases rely upon those controls. If we noted any significant control, control deficiencies, uh, we would bring those to your attention here. There are no such items. However, as Mo mentioned earlier, there is one internal control improvement recommendation and that relates to periodic user access reviews. Uh, this is actually a fairly common finding um, across the broader public sector, not just school boards. And uh, it, it's an issue where if there is no documentation of reviews of user access, it can obviously create a number of issues, um, including risks related to fraud or incorrect entries being posted or, or transactions being incorrectly approved. Through our discussions with management, uh, we are aware that there are mitigating controls in this area, which is one of the reasons why we do not consider this to in any way be significant, but we do bring it to your attention nonetheless. On to the next page, which has already been touched upon by one of the questions earlier, there are no unadjusted differences and there were also no adjustments that were recorded due to errors noted by BDO during the audit. This next page is just a, a bit of a laundry list of items that occur infrequently during the audit process, but if they do, we are required to discuss with an audit committee there are no such items to note, as you can see in the right-hand column, so I won't go into any detail on these items. The next number of pages I won't go through in, in much detail. They were in the planning letter, and they're mostly for information purposes. Just want to touch on two. Uh, the next page, Brian, the update to our audit process, which will impact your next audit. There will be a, a new risk assessment performed, uh, which may result in us bringing the risks to you in a different manner. Uh, so that is to be determined and we'll report that to you at the planning stage next year. And then the last item I wanted to note is a few pages down, uh, probably five or six pages down, just a spotlight on public sector, PS 3280 asset retirement obligations, which is a, a new accounting standard that will be in effect for your next year end. And it may have a significant impact on the financial statements. We have had preliminary conversations with Brian and Julie about this, and we will continue to do so to ensure a smooth transition to this new standard. And then scrolling down, Brian, into the appendices, the independent auditors report, which is appendix A. As you noted earlier, this is an unqualified opinion. 
which means that we completed our audits uh, without issues noted and, and we are in a position to sign off this unqualified audit opinion subject to the four items above being cleared off the outstanding list. And then finally, Appendix B is the management rep letter, uh, which we will ask management to sign once the statements have been approved by the Board of Trustees. And this letter uh, puts into writing many of the representations that we have verbally relied upon during the course of our audits um, uh, through our conversations with management. So that's the conclusion of our letter and we're happy to answer any questions on the content um, or on the audit process in general at this time. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Have any question to Marcus or uh, Mohammed? I do have a question. Okay, Laura, go ahead, Laura. Chair, um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember if BDO is the uh, the uh, financial statement auditors, but I believe I remember the school board addressing this, um, these AROs. Am I wrong in remembering that? Um, when you say addressing the AROs, can you elaborate? It's a note. Um, I think it was, there was a note in previous year's financial statements. Um, I'm just wondering if there was an assessment done in the past, because you're talking about how this could potentially have a impact on future years financial statements so um yeah no th there there would not have been in the past this is a new standard there is mm -hmm. a somewhat related standard which is liability for contaminated sites okay, so what you may be thinking is there was an accrual in that regard yeah and well i do remember a, a note being made that there was not none identified but uh yes, i'm just correct. trying to think ahead like if it's already been assessed, if it's actually going to impact. Did you say this is effective? 2020 to 2024 year end. So this will be, okay. sorry, 2023 20, year end. Uh, so it's next year. And, and just to draw a line of distinction between contaminated sites and ARO, the difference between the two, the most common example is asbestos, which was a, an insulated building material that that is, that is banned now that was used back in the 80s and early 90s. And under the contaminated site standard, you only have to accrue if you have exposed the asbestos to the environment, i.e. you have started to renovate or you have torn down a building. Under the new standard, you have to accrue the liability even if you have not exposed it to the environment because at some point in the future, you will have to remediate the asbestos. So you have to estimate that cost and accrue it into your 2023 financial statements. And that's at a high, at a August, high August 2023 financial. So this current school year. Correct. Correct? Yes. So at this time next year, we will be discussing the impact of that with you. Okay. I'll keep that in mind for the next year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You finished, Laura? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Have anybody else any questions? Okay, I mean, see anybody having any questions? The chair, Thomas, there is a motion yeah. for this report. Okay, there is a second motion that the audit committee recommend the board of trustees approve the consolidated financial statements and related information of the Dufferinville Catholic DC School Board uh, for the year ended August 31st, 2022. And Mr. Chair, could we add with amendments, please, as requested, since we directed the board to make some amendments to the report? Okay. As uh, amended. Okay. okay, as amended. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moved by Anna. Anybody oppose? It's carried. Okay, Anna. The chair, back to you. Okay, thank you very much. So we're now going to H2, Regional Internal Audit Team, for two-year two -year audit plan. Can we get receipt of the report, please? Yeah, it's so good I, I ask someone to move. Moved by Thomas. Thomas, anyone opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Uh, good evening through the chair. This evening, uh, we have with us from the Regional Internal Audit Team, Manager at Riyadh Viraj Trevetti um, joining us this evening. He's going to walk you through this report. Just as a bit of background, um, 
the regional internal audit team puts together an audit plan to address their requirement to conduct two, I, two audit engagements at each board within their region. Um, different appeals within the Toronto and area region, there's six boards, so they would have an obligation to do two audits at each of those six boards each year. The last time we had an audit plan was 2019. I believe we had a three-year plan from RIAT that was approved by the Board of Trustees and then acted on over those three years and into the current year. Um, this time, uh, RIAT has proposed a two-year audit plan to move forward. Um, that way, it involves a lesser time frame and, and maybe easier to manage the commitment to four audits as we move through the two years. Uh, they, did they did work on a risk assessment to help them um, narrow in on where audit engagements may be beneficial to school boards to be used. And I'm sure Viraj will talk you through that aspect of the report as well. So in order to go through the report, I believe it starts on page 65. The actual report itself from Viraj is page 66. And I'll hand it over to you, Viraj. Thanks, Julie. Uh, so I can, did, did you want me to bring up the, the report or can somebody bring that up? I'll ask uh, Superintendent Hester, he'll share his screen again if you would like to have the report on the sure. screen. That'd be great. It is helpful actually to everybody, so. And, and, also, and also for uh, people who are viewing the YouTube channel, so. Correct. Okay, so, so good evening everyone. And thanks Julie for the introduction. Um, so I, I'm here just to present the, uh, the our audit plan, uh, so the Regional Internal Audit Plan for 2022, years 2022-23 uh, and 2023-24. So as Julie mentioned, uh, we have changed uh, the approach now to uh, do a two-year enga two engagement plan, um, this sort of to align with some of the other boards as well. Uh, so that is one change from the, from the prior audit plan. It also gives us, you know, more flexibility as Judy, Julie mentioned as well. So, um, you know, we, we also want to thank senior management, uh, Julie and Brian, uh, the executive council for all of their, their help in, uh, in, in drafting this plan and uh, getting to the the proposed engagements here. So uh, we thank thank them for all of their valuable feedback as well. Um, you know, we I can go through some of the some of the criteria that we had used or our approach. Uh, Julia sort of already covered most of that, but um, you know, we did use a risk-based approach uh, to, to come up with our, our plan. Um, that was done through some some questionnaires that were sent out to uh, I guess to to various uh, senior management uh, individuals that sort of covered all of the academic and non-academic areas of the board. So basically covered all, all call key areas of, of the board. Uh, and so from, from there, uh, we, we sort of reviewed uh, the results of those questionnaires, um, had some follow-up discussions as well, and then use that information to draft our uh, proposed um, audit plan. Um, you know, as noted, uh, we also considered um, some of the, you know, the board strategic objectives, uh, our ability to add value, and um, also engagements that were completed or planned to be uh, completed at some of the other GTA boards that we uh, do we work with as well. So those are some of the considerations in, in coming up with, with the proposed engagements. Um, we did um, we did present a list of engagements, um, and then Julie and Brian took those back uh, to the executive council and shared shared those results with them, uh, and then through uh, follow up discussions, um, we we arrived at the the four uh, proposed engagements that we have here. So, um, so I'm just going to go through uh, and and sort of summarize, uh, you know, some of some of these engagements, and 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 then feel free to to ask any questions as needed. So, um, the engagements are presented. Uh, based on the year plan. So um, obviously the first one uh, for 2022-23, uh, which we have is legislative compliance. Um, so this is something that we're currently working with other boards and uh, in, in going through this exercise as well. Um, this is a consulting engagement. So uh, what, we, what, we, what we're doing is we're using uh, the approach that one of the other regional internal audit teams had done um, with some of their boards in the past. Um, where they developed a, um, 
I guess, a, a legislative compliance uh, to almost like a toolkit, uh, which covers um, key legislation across across the board. Um, and from and that exercise, really, the, the, the main purpose is to sort of develop a, a formal framework um, in which uh, the board can, you know, takes takes on themselves and, and they sort of work to identify what some of the, the you know, higher, higher, medium, low risk areas are. Um, they do that and then they, they sort of identify, um, you know, what, what some of the key controls they have in place um, and, and, and then also um, come up with sort of a residual risk. Uh, and that's something that the board will maintain uh, moving forward. So it's really a, a good exercise to go through and uh, identify, um, you know, all of the legislation, make sure that, you know, there are controls in place um, that, and there are, um, you know, and if there are any higher, higher or medium risk areas that, um, you know, ma management's monitoring those controls um, or monitoring those risk areas as well to, to, to implement controls to, to reduce the risk. Um, so that's, um, you know, that's something that, that, that will, we uh, plan to, to complete uh, for this fiscal year. Um, and then obviously we'll share that, uh, the results of that um, with the audit committee. Uh, the next one um, is, is a benchmarking engagement. So um, some of you may recall that we had done a, a benchmarking engagement um, a few years ago, um, which I, I believe from memory serves me correct, I believe four out of the six boards had participated in, in that engagement. Um, and so this one is a, a follow-up uh, engagement to that, which was brought forward um, by senior management to, to us as a REAT. Um, so this one is sort of more, uh, you know, mo moving more outside of even our um, immediate GTA REAT. Um, so, so management had identified this, um, you know, mainly due to some of the declining enrollment and, and financial pressures um, that the board is facing. So they would look like to, to have us um, assist with, you know, identifying whether um, there are, identifying through other boards um, you know, some of the areas around staffing, uh, staffing levels by department, um, looking at departmental structures um, for some of the some of the areas such as uh, HR, uh, finance and IT. Um, so this this engagement will will actually involve um, collaboration with um, other other boards outside of our, our immediate jurisdiction, as well as some of the other uh, regional internal audit teams as well, because uh, what we're looking to do here, and Julie, feel free to step in at any time. Um, what we're looking to do here is look at boards that are similar in size to uh, to, to, to Dufferin Peel, um, and so um, you know some of the other other areas that we also plan to capture uh, could include a comparison of uh, school utilization. So really, these are um, so, and I guess the other thing I didn't mention as well is um, these are sort of initial. Um, scope, you know, things may change as, as we sort of get into the engagements and develop the scope a little further with management, but at a high level, um, this is a scope that we're, we're planning to move forward with, with all of these engagements. So um, the next one is a, um, was something that was identified, uh, you know, as, as a, as a, as a risk area through, through many of the responses uh, that we received from the risk assessment. So, um, obviously, HR is sort of one of the top of mind areas for not just for Dufferin Peel, but for um, <clears throat> many of the other GTA boards as well. Um, specifically, staff retention uh, and availability availability of qualified individuals uh, to fill critical roles at the board. Um, so this is a piece of work. Again, it's more of a consulting engagement that we we have um, started uh, and completed at some of our, the other GTA boards as well. Um, so the, the plan here is to sort of develop a uh, standardized approach uh, to assist the board uh, in managing positions that they believe are critical um, for continuity of business operations. So this would this would be um, could be either academic or non-academic as well. Um, and so it involves um, preparation of a of a toolkit, sort of a meet position matrix um, where the board would then you know, work with the applicable departments and sort of go through and identify, OK, well, which of these positions are critical and what are some of the things that um, the board can do to make sure that there are uh, in fact succession plans in place and things like that. So, um, you know, again, it goes back to, you know, retention uh, mechanisms for knowledge sharing and things like that. So, um, so that that's, that's um, the other engagement that's planned for the following year. Uh, and then finally, um, again, this was also something that uh, was, was brought forward by, by senior management. Uh, was a IT asset sustainability review. Um, so again, the rationale for this was, uh, you know, 
close, tying closely back to the board's, uh, you know, they're the multi-year strategic plan and their board's objectives, which is obviously student achievement and well-being. So, um, you know, given the financial constraints and declining enrollment, there is a risk that students will not have the right tools to succeed uh, when assets purchased, especially when assets uh, are purchased with uh, one-time funding reach uh, the end of life. Uh, so, so this this is something that is a, sort of a complement to a previously planned uh, IT asset management audit. Um, that one was more focused on um, you know how student devices are managed and the rollout of those devices uh, throughout the asset life cycle. Um, the objective of this game, engagement is a little bit different, so it's more of a, a strategy um, focused engagement to look at um, approaches that the board can use um, around student devices. Um, you know, what are some of the current practices or current state, um, you know, of how devices are being distributed, what are the current ratios of devices to student, how is that determined, um, so, and then also looking at other boards and what their strategies are um, to, you know, around their, around student devices as well, uh, and then sort of working together again with management to develop a, a, a strategy um, for the board to sort of have a sustainable approach going forward and on student devices. Um, and so that um, concludes all of the, those are the four engagements that we've got proposed um, for the uh, the next two year cycle for our audit plan. Um, so I'll stop there and um, see if there's any questions. Thank you very much for the report. Um, any, does anyone have any questions? I do. Okay, Laura. Go ahead. Yes, uh, through the chair. Um, you mentioned when you were talking about the IT asset sustainability. Um, it, I was wondering if there's going to be an update provided to us on the IT asset management audit. It was uh, it was addressed at our last meeting by Paula, and um, if you're you're saying that the Sorry, I'm, I've lost my spot here. IT asset sustainability is a complement to the previous planned IT asset management audit. So are you still working on that audit? Yes, so, through, so through the chair, yes, we, we still are working on that engagement as well. So through the chair, I, I can just add a little bit. Um, that was one of the planned audits under the last three-year plan. It's been delayed just slightly just due to some internal change, um, loss of a CIO. We just want to make sure we have staff in place before we engage in that audit so that they have an opportunity to provide input and, and knowledge towards that engagement. So it's been delayed just a little bit. That's why this new one is being planned for the further out in the two-year plan. So we'll do the asset management audit engagement first and then move into the asset sustainability one. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, um, may I ask someone to move the motion number two that the audit committee recommend that the Board of Trustees approve the regional internal audit 2022-2024 um, audit plan. Who moved by yep. Thomas, is it? Yes. Uh, uh, Rory? Okay, second okay, by, sorry. okay. Anyone opposed? Okay, carried. Okay, so mm -hmm. now we have no notices of motion, no additional business questions. Any questions have been um, asked by the audit committee members? Um, I have a question, if no one else does. Um, through the chair, if I could pass the chair on. Okay, for, to, right. okay. Uh, my question, it's just a question, it's a comment. I was going to ask um, that we send uh, the backgrounds, the new backgrounds to our um, our committee members, Laura and Rory, so that they also have the um, the new backgrounds to be used during the committee meet, uh, audit committee meeting. So that way we know who the committee members are. So if I could ask that those be sent to the two members, um, sure. I would appreciate it. That's all my comment is. Sure, you. thank you. Can do. Okay. okay. So any okay. other questions or? 
Okay, no more questions of it in camera. So we now need to a motion to move to in camera. So move, I move. Okay, move be oh. by Trustee Di Casola. Yep. Okay, anyone opposed? It's carried. Okay, so at this time, we will be leaving the live stream. Um, you will be asked to join those members who will be going into an in-camera meeting room and then others who will be going into an in-camera waiting room um, until your time to come in and present a report. Um, and for those of you who have presented with us this evening, thank you very much. Um, so Marcus and Mohammed and Viraj, thanks for being with us this evening. You're free to go once we enter into those rooms um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. For anyone else who's watching, you will remain here until we come back from our in-camera session and then we will be back into open session. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for coming and presenting. It was very nice to see your reports. Thank you. Soon you'll get a request to enter into a specific room. Okay, I think we're back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, is everybody here? Yeah, we'll just see if Emery, yeah, we're good. Oh, Emery does stop sharing. Okay. Okay, so we are now in camera. So, um, the, so in, we're no um, longer in camera and sorry. we're in <laughs> open session. Yeah, we're now back into open session uh, in camera. We had the uh, uh, we approved minutes, uh, received three audit reports, and approved the detailed and summarized annual reports for the 2021-2022 year. And may I ask someone to move the uh, and uh, to make a motion to approve the report from in camera? Moved by Thomas Thomas. Yep. Okay. Okay. Anyone opposed? It's carried. <clears throat> may I ask someone to um, a motion to adjourn the meeting? Moved by Laura. Yes. Anyone opposed? Okay, carried. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to the public for participating. And thank you, all of you. It's uh, just been, it's been a pleasure working with you and um, have a good Christmas and uh, good, uh, good new year. Thank you, everyone.